So you probably got the sense from lecture one that we're going to be doing some rather complicated things and definitely not uh, calculations that can be done by hand. Um, as, as a data scientist or machine learning expert, uh, you're, you're not gonna be working your calculations out on paper and you need software. And for the most part, you need to know a programming language. So this lecture is intended to introduce you to a programming language, uh, in particular, the, the interface and doing some very basic things in it. And then uh, the next six lectures, including this one, this one and the next five, uh, will introduce you to data structures, how to use functions and write functions in the language, uh, some programming concepts, and then finally how to make plots. And after that, we can really get into statistical learning material. All right, so first, kind of an overview and some terminology. We're gonna be using a language called R. Uh, and a, a valid question is, why are we using R as opposed to some other language? And I would say, if I was teaching this course in a biostatistics program, where students would be most likely to go into uh, clinical trials or maybe work for a government agency like the FDA, I'd probably teach SAS. That would be most appropriate for their career path. If I was teaching this out of the computer science department, um, I would probably teach it using Python. And in fact, one of my students uh, graduated a couple of years ago when I saw him over the weekend. He did get a machine learning oriented job and he mostly uses Python for his work. But because I'm teaching this out of a uh, mathematical sciences department for statistics concentration, where our students have sort of a equal chance of either going into industry uh, or going further into academia, going into a, a doctoral degree and doing some research, I think R is the best for, for them. Another thing I like about R is it's open source and it's free. There's a very large community uh, supporting it. So if you have questions on something, uh, Stack Exchange, lots and lots of webs websites and blogs and tutorials, uh, it's pretty easy to get help on it. Now I'll show you the very most basic way of using R just briefly. You can download it onto a desktop and open up a command line interface like this. Uh, but I, I pretty much never use this because it's so basic. It, it lacks a lot of features and it makes it difficult to do complicated things. So I'm just showing it to you once and then we'll, we'll never use it again. Uh, I like the analogy that trying to do statistics and data science using this command line interface, it's like trying to cook a meal over a, uh, over a campfire. You know, can't easily make a lasagna over a campfire. It's not hard to do complicated, or it is hard to do complicated data science just with the R command line. So instead, we're going to use R Studio, which is uh, a development environment for working with the language. And there's multiple ways to access this. You can download it onto a computer and use R Studio desktop. And that's what I tend to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now for you, and a lot of people in the class will be learning it for the first time, uh, we're going to use R Studio Cloud. So let me go there now. So there's multiple workspaces for this. I've invited you to the workspace for this class. So I'll, I'll navigate there. And uh, let me go ahead and click over here and I'll open up a, a new project. I'll choose new RStudio project. It'll take just a moment to deploy. And once it's up, we'll see it's got exactly the same interface as RStudio desktop. It's just here. You don't have to set up that development environment yourself. Uh, I can do a lot of that work for you. In fact, when it comes up, you may notice there's a whole lot of text here. It looks like it's already installed some things. That's because I set up a base project that installs a lot of the stuff you're gonna need uh, for your homework assignments throughout the class. Uh, so you don't have to install that yourself. It's already done for you. All right, one other bit of terminology is uh, R Markdown. Once we complete an analysis, we'll want to communicate it to perhaps people who are not as technically skilled. Uh, and R Markdown is a file format for doing that. And at the end of the lecture, we'll actually create a bare bones R Markdown document. So just to reiterate, R is the name of the language. R Studio is the software that makes it a little bit easier to work with the language. And then R Markdown is the file format that we'll use to communicate things when we're done with it. In fact, the notes for the class, those are created in R Markdown. So let's look at the uh, interface just briefly. There's four main parts, although we only see three of them when we first start this. 
Over here on the left, this largest pane, this is the console. This is where we type commands to run in R. It's also where we'll see the output, the results of those commands. So just very simply, let me come down here to the bottom. I'll just type two plus two. I'll hit enter. All right, I can see the result of that is for the, the console is the most basic and most direct way of interacting with the R language. Now soon we're going to open up another pane and the console will, will retreat down to the lower left and we'll have a pane in the upper left for uh, scripts and for our markdown documents. I'm just going to go back to my desktop version so you can see, yes, I do have a different pane in the upper left and we'll open one of those soon ourselves. In the upper right, uh, we have the environment tab. Once we start defining objects in R, that's where we'll see their names and their values. It's a good place to see what's present, what you've already calculated. Another thing that's useful is the history tab. So if I click on that, I can see all the commands that have been run uh, in this project so far. There's the most recent one, the two plus two. And then you can see some of the commands that I had done earlier uh, to install some packages so that you wouldn't have to. There's a couple other tabs here, but we won't be using those, so don't worry about them. I usually let this one sit on environment. In the lower right, we've got several miscellaneous panes. Uh, the one it defaults to is files. So here there's a folder and we can see uh, all the stuff that's already present in the directory. And another thing that I started you with is a template for an R markdown file. Let me just click that briefly. So I can open up a file that's already uh, present. And uh, notice that opens up that upper left pane now. And so we can see uh, the contents of that document. A couple other things that are important down here. We haven't made any plots yet, but once we do, that'll be in the plots tab of the lower right pane. Oh, there's packages, which we won't worry about for a while. And I don't have to use it very much either, but it lets me see what packages are installed for the language to access. Uh, the help tab, we will be using this one a lot. Right now it's showing some general help, places you can go to learn more about R. And then later, once we uh, request help for working with a particular function, then uh, that will appear here. There's also viewer and presentation. Uh, those we'll use more rarely. I'd say the three most important ones are uh, files, plots, and help. And I'll let this sit back on, on files. All right, so that's a quick tour of the interface. Uh, let me pause. Do you have any questions about that at this point or comments? All right, now I'll keep on going. So now I actually want to start working with R, but the first thing I want to do, I want to change the appearance of this. Uh, by default, it is blindingly white. Uh, and I, I use this all the time, both for coursework and for research. And it really strains my eyes to be looking at something so, so uh, glaringly white all the time. So here's something you can do if you want something that'll reduce your eye strain. If you go to tools and then global options, and this is something I didn't have typed out in the notes. So you may want to make a note yourself if you plan on doing it. Under tools and global options, you can go to appearance, and you can choose a theme for the editor. And there's lots of them. You can look through and see which one you like. Uh, my favorite has become Tomorrow Night Bright. And then another thing that I do since I'm getting old man eyes, I'll increase the editor font size a little bit so I don't have to strain so much. So changing the font size and then changing my editor theme. Now I'll, I'll hit okay. Ah, much better. Now everything is dark by default and then a the little bit of text is white. And uh, I've actually found I get much fewer headaches working this way at the end of the day. All right, were you able to follow that okay? Did I go too fast? Any questions there? All right, let's actually start using the language a little bit. I'm going to close out this uh, script in the upper left. I just want to work in the console right now. So let's pretend that you are a painter and you've been contracted to paint three sections of a wall. Uh, each section of the wall is 13 feet high, 75 feet long. Paint is sold in quarts. Each quart covers 100 square feet and costs $16.98, tax included. How many $20 bills should you request from your supervisor 
to take to the paint store? Well, this is a pretty straightforward arithmetic problem. It'll just take several steps. First thing I'd like to know is what's the area of one of these sections of the wall? That will be 13 times 75. So we'll type 13, use the asterisk for multiplication. But first I wanna make a little point. I want to purposely make a mistake so that you know what to do uh, if you make this yourself and eventually you will. I'm not gonna put in the 75 yet. I'm gonna have an incomplete command. I'm gonna go ahead and press enter. Now notice my prompt has changed. Before I had a greater than. That's the symbol that means R is waiting for you to begin a new command. Because this command was not complete, that's changed into a plus. So it's saying, you know, what can you give me additionally to help me complete this command? So I could either type in the 75 and it could complete the multiplication and I can get my, my answer. But most of the time, if I get that plus there, it's the result of putting in too complicated of an expression and I'm missing some parentheses. A lot of times I just want to abort that attempt and start over from scratch. So if that happens, just press escape and it'll give up on that command and let you go back to the prompt. So long story short, if you have a plus sign there and it's not an easy fix, just press escape and try again. Okay, going back to the problem at hand. These walls are 13 feet tall and 75 feet long. So each wall, each section has a uh, square footage of 975. Well, there's three sections of wall. So I need to do 975 times three. Okay, so there's the total square footage across all sections of the wall. Each uh, can of paint will cover 100 square feet. So I need to do some division. 2925 over 100. We're gonna need 29.25 cans of paint, but I can't purchase a fractional uh, can of paint. So I gotta round this up. I'm gonna have to buy 30 discrete cans. So I'm gonna buy 30 cans and each one costs $16.98. So here's the total cost in dollars, $509.40. I'm gonna be requesting $20 bills out of the company treasury. So let me divide by 20. I need 25.47 $20 bills, but it doesn't make sense to have a fractional number of $20 bills, right? I got to round that up as well. So I take 26 as my, my final answer. All right, hopefully pretty simple so far. Any questions there? Are you able to at least test out a few of these commands and get some results? Any problems yet? All right, something else I'll point out about the interface. Before the output, I'm getting a one in square brackets. That's telling me uh, what component of the output this is. Now, right now, all of our calculations are giving us back single numbers. So we just see a one in the brackets. It's not very meaningful or useful right now. But later, we're gonna do calculations where the output is not a single number, but it might be a vector that has maybe 200 values in it. Then having that, uh, uh, indicator of the index at the beginning of each line helps us identify values in that very long vector. So that'll be useful later. So you go to your boss and you say, I need 26 $20 bills. And they say, well, actually there was a mistake on the work order and the walls aren't 13 feet tall, they're 15 feet tall. So now we have to go back and do all our calculations again, right? Uh, we see the problem with working straight out of the console. The things that we type in, they're kind of ephemeral, they're kind of temporary. It's there for a moment and does the calculation and, and then it's gone. Now, truthfully, it's not completely gone. There's a couple of ways that you can get back the commands you've already typed in. Remember the history pane up here in the upper right. I can see all these commands that I put in. So I could go back here where I started, 13 times the 75. And I've got a couple of options for putting this back into the console. I can click to console, and now it repeats that 13 times 75, and it's not quite as big of a deal to go back and edit that and then start my calculations from there. Okay, another thing you can do, if you have your cursor at the console, press the up and down arrow keys. As you press up, it goes backwards into the history, all the commands that you've put in recently. And then as you press down, it comes back forward through that. So if you, 
type a command and you want to edit it a little bit or maybe made a small mistake, you don't have to type it completely from scratch. Press up till you find it again, make your edit, and that'll save you a little bit of time. But still, this is not the best way to set up our calculations. Uh, we want something that's more permanent uh, for a couple of reasons. One is reproducibility. Uh, another one is communication. If we do a complicated analysis, we don't just want to be able to give the results to somebody else. We'd like to be able to give the entire process of commands that produce that result. Maybe they're an expert that peer reviews our code uh, or, or a colleague that's doing a code review, making sure we're doing everything correctly. So a better thing to do would be, let's do these calculations in a script. So I'm gonna come up here to new file and there's lots of different kinds of files you can open. Let's start with the simplest kind, which is just a script. All right, so now this opens up a pane in the top left. Now I'm gonna set up my calculations up here and I'm not just gonna put in numbers, but I think I would like to assign uh, some names to these numbers and then I can set up calculations that'll be more meaningful. So let's start here. Let me make a variable called section length and I want to give this the value of 75. Now in R, there's two ways to assign a, a, a name to a value. Probably most natural to you would be an equal sign and that works, but R has a special assignment operator, which is, it's this arrow. It's a less than and then a dash. Now that might seem annoying. Why would I want to type two symbols when I could just press one? And you've got a fair point. There's a hotkey that'll let you create this very quickly. On Windows, if you do Alt and then dash, it'll put down that whole symbol at once. Uh, I'd say go ahead and get used to that. There are some advantages to using this assignment operator and we'll, we'll see some of those later in the class. I want to assign uh, to section link the value of 75. Let me go ahead and set up some of my other values. And if you're working along, uh, you can either type these out the same way I am, or if you've got your uh, the lecture notes of the PDF, you can copy and paste that to save yourself a little bit of time. Okay, so I set up assignments for all of the values that are given in the problem and that I'll do other calculations based on. All right, so just having these here doesn't actually run or execute these commands. They're here for me to execute and work with. Let me change my upper right tab back to the environment. And right now it's empty. And let me run some of these lines. So there's a, a lot of ways you can do this. If I want to run just one line at a time, I can put my cursor anywhere on that line and nothing has to be highlighted. I can just have my cursor there and I press control enter. If you're on a Mac, you will press uh, command enter. All right, so I had my cursor on the first line and see what it did. It took that command, stuck it down here in the console and it actually executed it for me. Let me remove this other command out of the, at the prompt. I don't need that. Also notice up here in my environment, I now have an object. The name of it is section length and the value of it is 75. Let me go to my next line. I can run that one. Now I've uh, assigned to section height the value of 13 and I can see that in my environment. And you can do that. You can just press control enter for each one of these lines. Or if I want to run multiple lines at once, I can highlight all three of those, press control enter. I can see all of them have now appeared in the console. They've been run. And so now all of these values are defined in the environment. Okay, so let me, let me pause again. How are you keeping up? Everything going okay? All right, I'll keep on going. <laughs> now that all these values are defined, I'd like to actually use them to do some calculations. And I'm, I'm kind of moving into a different mode here. 
I've, want, I've gone from defining some values to doing some calculations with them. And maybe I'd like to put in uh, just a note to myself that helps me organize uh, conceptually what these different sections of code do. So I can do that by putting in a comment. A comment is a line of code that is not run or evaluated, but it's just something that's readable to the user. And we can start those in a script with a pound sign. So I'll put down a pound sign and I'll say, ah, oh, values. And that's just a little note to myself that all the stuff right after that is where I'm defining the values. And I'll come down here and I'm about to start another section. I'll call that one calculations. Now here's another neat thing that you can do with comments. If at the end of a comment, you put a minimum of four dashes. So if I do at least four, that turns this into a code section. You notice right here beside line one, I've now got that little triangle symbol. I can click that and that'll fold this section. So maybe I set up my values and then I don't need to look at that part. I'm ready to work on some other part of my script. I can click that and then hide it. That's really nice when you get a, uh, a long script with many sections in it uh, and you just don't need to see everything all at once. I'll also put four dashes after calculations to set up a section for this. Uh, and another nice thing, down here at the bottom of the script, if I click this, now it shows me all the code sections and, and their name, which is given in the rest of the comment. And that's really helpful for jumping around and navigating uh, in a long document with lots of sections. Okay, but I'd like to fill in the rest of my calculations. And for this part, I don't wanna take the time to type all of it. I did have it in the notes. So I'm going to, I'm gonna take this part and I'll copy and paste that in. Okay, so let's take a look at what I'm doing. On line eight, I'm doing two things simultaneously. First, I'm calculating the total square footage to area, the length times the section times the number of sections. And it's doing all of that, but then it's assigning that to the value area. Here's another thing. We've seen that we can run an entire line by just having the cursor there and hitting control enter. If I want to run just a piece of a line, I can highlight just the piece of it that I want to run and see the result of that calculation. So what if I'm just curious about the square footage of one section and I just want to see what the result of section length times section height is? I can highlight that, press control enter. It'll take exactly the text that I've highlighted move that down to the console, and I can see the result of just that portion of the calculation. That's really nice. But let me run the whole thing. So I'll just have my cursor there without any highlighting. It runs uh, the entire line nine. Ah, okay. I wasn't planning on uh, demonstrating what happens when an error happens, but it happens. So, well, let's figure it out. I get an error. The object num section is not found. Uh, but I thought I'd define that on line four. Anybody see why I got that error? Yeah, um, at line four, you said a um, non section. Why are we having non sections put up? So it does, I think it doesn't recognize the. Um, this is like a single non section, but you're having non sections. The X is missing. Yeah, when I typed it a minute ago, I meant to have an S at the end of that. I missed it. And then when I referred to it later, it's got an S at the end, it was plural. Those are not exactly the same variable name. So uh, yeah, I need to go back. Uh, since I made a change here to line four, I'm going to rerun line four. So let me run that again. And now I can see in my environment, I have num sections plural with the value of three uh, like I wanted. Okay, so let me try running line nine again. Okay, so it's run without error and I can see in the environment, there's that total area with a value of 29.25. Okay, now remember uh, when we take the area, we divide by area per quart, it tells us how many cans of paint we need, but we can't buy a fractional part. We always have to round that up, right? So I'm putting this into a function called ceiling. The ceiling function, if I run that, 
making sure I pick up that parentheses at the end, it closes it off. It takes the inside part, 29.25, rounds it up to 30. So that's nice. I don't have to do the rounding myself. The ceiling function does it for me. So I can take the number of quarts, multiply by the cost. Ah, okay. I never run the entirety of line 11, so it didn't actually assign uh, and create a variable name known quarts. I run the whole thing. Then I can get my cost of $509.4. Divide that by 20 to see how many $20 bills I need using the ceiling function to round it up. And it looks like I need 26 uh, $20 bills to take to the paint store. All right, one thing that I'll note is uh, here on line 14, I've got the name of a, of a variable, of an object, but I'm not using it as part of a calculation or assigning anything to it. If you just have it by itself on a line, when you run that line, it'll just print the value of that. It'll show you what that object is. And that object is just the number 26. All right, so remember, there was a mistake on the order form and the walls are not actually 13 feet high. They're 15 feet high. So I'm going to change that to 15. And let me go back and see how many bills I need to take now. Oh, it still says 26. Uh, that doesn't seem right. I made the wall taller. I should require more paint, should cost more, but it says I need to take the same number of bills. Does anybody know at this point why that didn't work? I'll help you out. This is a really common beginner mistake. Just changing that line in the script does not run all the lines after it. It doesn't change the intermediate values and it doesn't change update the objects in the environment. So what I need to do is rerun line three and then all the calculations after that that make use of it so that everything is updated. So here's a good practice. Anytime you make a significant change, especially near the beginning of a script that's going to affect the things after that, Clear your environment. Up here, there's a broom symbol in the upper right. Click that and it just says, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? And yeah, yeah, I do. So now that wipes out the environment. That's a good thing because that forces me to run stuff from the beginning and I'm not gonna get wrong answers because I'm using old values before a change that I made. Does that make sense? Yeah. This was a... Uh, a really common mistake when I was first learning R, and I'm finally starting to get better at it. Uh, it. It's a good practice very often. Clear your environment, force yourself to run things from the beginning, and you don't get mistakes and, and confusion uh, because of some old values. Okay, so I redefined all the values. Let me run through all those calculations again. Okay, and this makes sense. This time I need 29 $20 bills uh, to take to the store. All right, so uh, I'm not sure if you're actually having time to work through this alongside me, but do you have any questions at this point? Okay, I'll show you one little thing for now. We'll get too much uh, deeper in the class. I'm using this function called ceiling, and that's built into R. Maybe I'm curious about how this works and if there's other functions that play similar roles. So you could, of course, Google it, and you could find the R documentation. But all the R documentation is built into the language, and we can see it inside R Studio. In my console, if I put a question mark, and then I type the name of the function that I'm curious about, right now the ceiling function. Okay, now this has changed me to the Help tab in the lower right pane. Let's look at this. It's actually giving me a help file, not just on ceiling, but on uh, kind of a suite, a collection of functions that all deal with rounding. So there's ceiling, which rounds up, floor, which rounds down, trunk, which truncates, which kind of just chops off some digits at the end. There's the normal kind of rounding that you've been using since elementary school. And if I want a certain number of significant figures, there's the function signif. Now below that, it starts to get a little more technical and it shows me how to use it and what all the arguments mean and then some details. Uh, when we get into, I think lecture five, we'll start learning how to read the documentation um, well and, and more carefully. Uh, when I started learning R, I actually didn't find the documentation very helpful. It took me a while to learn how to read it. 
So I'm hoping I can help you along with that. All right, so let's go to the next section and let's start talking about how we might communicate these results. Uh, a script like this, this is great if I'm just doing some analysis, uh, maybe something really quick and dirty that I don't need to uh, communicate to somebody else, uh, something that, that's only for, for my eyes. But if I'm doing some calculations and I've got colleagues, maybe some co-authors on a paper that need to see this research and understand it themselves, or maybe I need to present the results of this to a, a supervisor, maybe my department chair who's not a statistician, doesn't really care about all these little details of the calculations, but they wanna see some nice graphics, some plots, and they wanna see the results of the calculations with some ordinary English text to explain it to them. Then I would switch to an R Markdown document. So uh, there's two ways that you could open one. I do have kind of a template for you down here, uh, or you can go to new file, go to an R, R Markdown. And I guess let's start with this one. So there's actually a lot of different subtypes of R Markdown documents. You can use them to make presentations in something called a Shiny app. Just leave it on document for now. You can fill in a title and you can give an author, uh, author and a date. And I guess I'll, I'll do this. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna work on a paint project right now. I'll give my name. I can give the date. And here's a neat option. I believe this one's uh, somewhat new. You can click use current date when rendering document. That way, if you work on this over multiple days, it'll automatically use the most recent one when you've worked out of the document uh, most recently. For the default output format, uh, I'm gonna suggest for this class that you'll use PDF. And the main reason is when you upload your assignments to Folio for me to grade your homework, Folio doesn't deal well with HTML documents. It is possible to make the HTML and then convert it to a PDF, but then it looks kind of ugly and it's got some stuff in the margins. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna request, uh, please just make a PDF document from the output. That's what I'm doing in my class notes. All right, so now I've got a very different looking uh, kind of document and we'll go through, we'll go through all the pieces of this. Uh, I'll just point out that to start with, it does kind of fill one out so that you've got some examples of things that you might want to do to, to work off of. Let's do this. Uh, since most of the work of the paint project has already been done for us, and I've actually already created the R Markdown document, let me copy and paste all the stuff starting here. So not the part at the very top that has the title, the author, the date, because that's already been filled out for us. I'm gonna select the rest of this. And then I'll select everything below that header at the top. And I'll delete that out. And then I'll paste in what, I, what I've pulled out of the notes. Okay, it looks complicated, but it's not quite as bad as it appears. Let's go through it piece by piece. This part at the top, uh, lines one through six, that's called the YAML which stands for YAML ain't a markup language. Uh, very clever, it's a recursive acronym. Um, all you need to know is it's where you can put in some of the very basic information about the document and some options. We only need a very short one. As you get more advanced, there's a lot of different options you can put in to control how your document is produced. But let's start simple and just use this right now. Now the next things, lines uh, eight, nine, and 10, uh, that's another thing for setting up some options for the document. I'm gonna say just leave that as the default right now. Don't worry about that just yet. Let's come down here. Let's actually start thinking in detail around line, line 12. Uh, so maybe you've heard of Markdown, which is a kind of a word processing language. It's very common on the internet for, uh, like for example, if you're a Reddit user and you're making a Reddit post or, or comment, uh, you can actually type that in something called Markdown to control the formatting. It's, uh, it's pretty intuitive and pretty easy to do. And Markdown is very popular and there's lots of uh, variants of it, including this one, which is R Markdown, which lets us combine R code with Markdown for text processing so we can make some, some nice looking documents. Now in Markdown, if you use a pound sign, 
that's not a comment like it would be in R code. In Markdown, uh, that's a header. So what I'm doing here is I'm just making kind of a header, like a, not a title for the document, but like a heading for a section, I'm calling it analysis of cache needed, and it formats that in green. After that, I've just got a little bit of ordinary text. The following calculations, we use to determine the amount of cache withdrawn for the wall painting project, just communicating to whoever reads this what they're about to, about to read. All right, I will put in a little separation here. So now I'm ready to put in some R code. And so R code has to be placed inside something called an R chunk. So you'll notice there's three of these back tick symbols. The back tick on your keyboard is to the left of the digit one. And then inside brackets, it says, well, this is going to be R code. And the reason it specifies that is it's possible to have other languages in here as well. You can make a, an R markdown document that has Python code. We won't be doing that in this class, but it is possible. And then the paint, that's just a, a name or a label for this uh, chunk of code. Then there's, this is just a copy paste of the stuff we had in the script from recently. Uh, and then there's three back ticks that close off the R chunk. And that says, I'm done with the R code for now. Let's go back to regular markdown and just putting out some text. Now, uh, here's a nice keyboard shortcut to, to know about. If I want to insert a chunk, I don't actually have to type the uh, back ticks and the brackets and the R. If you hit Control Alt I, then that will give you an empty, very basic uh, R chunk. And then I could start putting my, my commands in here. But I don't actually need that one, so I'm going to delete it out. Now, inside the R chunk, I can treat this just like I did the script. So let me pretend I'm starting from scratch. Let me clear out the environment. I can select these lines or any portion of a line and run them. So let me just run through those quickly and make sure that there's no errors. Okay, it looks like I've got valid R code uh, in, inside that chunk. Now, after this, I've got some text and it says, based on this, I am requesting and we want to communicate that we need $29 bills, but I don't actually want to type the digits 29 because that might change if the work order changes, right? Maybe I'd like to reuse this document next week when we're painting a taller wall, or maybe the price of paint has gone down or something else has changed. What I'd like it to do, I'd like it to reference the value of this variable and put that in. So here's how I accomplish that. I put just a single back tick and it starts with R, which is saying, I need you to actually evaluate this next thing as if it's a little piece of R code, which it is. I put the name of the variable. And so when it runs and creates this document, it's going to run that as R code. NumBills is going to get converted into the number 29. And this is going to spit out that we're requesting 29, $20 bills. All right, and I think we're ready to test that. So the process of creating a document out of this is called knitting. And there's a button for it right here. And you have to save the document before you do that. So uh, let me just give it a name, I'll call it paint. I save it and then it thinks for just a moment. All right, and then a PDF pops up. Let's take a look at this. I see the title, the author and the date that were put in the YAML, the part at the top. There's that heading, analysis of cash needed. There's the ordinary text. And then we can see all of the code that's in the R chunk is right here. I can see uh, what would normally go to the console. So normally numbills would spit out the number 29. I can just as if it would go to the console. And then text again, based on this I'm requesting and I can see it's evaluated that R numbills as the number 29 uh, and inserted that for me. So this is pretty nice, right? It's rather automatic. Let me close out this version of the document. And let's suppose that the uh, price of paint goes up, maybe goes up a lot, maybe it's $23.50. When I click knit, it's going to run all this code again. So stuff that's in our markdown document, you don't actually have to run it piece by piece like you would in a script. It's gonna run everything. I hit knit. 
All right, and I can see the output is now 40 and it's even replaced that here. Now we're requesting 40 $20 bills to take to the paint store. All right, I think this is pretty cool. Any questions or comments from you at this point? All right, we're actually nearly done. Let me show you a couple of other things that you can do in our markdown and that'll prepare you for the uh, eventual homework assignment. So let me close this out. So uh, there are a lot of ways you could format text. So if you want um, bold, italics, you wanna change a font size, um, you wanna insert images, you want a, uh, an ordered list or a bulleted list, Lots of different ways you can do that. And I'm not gonna show you them all one by one, but I'll show you where to look for help. If I click on help, and I go to cheat sheets. This is really useful. Uh, the people at R Studio have made cheat sheets for a lot of the common tasks that you need to do in R. Let me go to the R Markdown Reference Guide. So that opens up a, a document that, that's online somewhere and here we can see what you would type in Markdown to get different results over here. Like I can use uh, single italics around, or I'm sorry, single asterisks around something to make italics, uh, doubled asterisks around something to make it bold. I can make superscripts. I've got different kinds of headers. Uh, here's where I can put in an image. Uh, I believe there's even a way to put in an internet link if you want to make tables or, uh, or different kinds of lists. Um, really handy guide. So let me try to just do a, a couple of these to illustrate. Let's say that I'm really tired of being a painter, I'm fed up with it. And so, tell them I hereby tender my resignation as a wall painter. I wanna add some emphasis by bolding hereby tender. And then I'll put italics around wall painter. All right, so. First, let me knit it. Let's just make sure that works. All right, and there's that text with the formatting that I've added to it. I hereby tender my resignation as a wall painter. Now here's something else. This is neat and this is kind of new. This has not been an RStudio feature for very long. Up here, I've got two options. Source, which is what I've been doing now, which is kind of making things very manually. But now there's a visual editor. Let me click on that and switch to it. And it tells me about it. Uh, you're switching visual editing mode. Here's how to change back if you want to. I'll click use visual editing mode. So now see some of the stuff is like it was before, like the YAML and the, the R chunks. But for the text, I'm actually seeing here something very similar to what I would see in, uh, in, in the document that's produced when I knit it. So for example, the bold, and the italics that shows up here. And I've got some uh, menus here for doing things like formatting the text a certain way. If I wanna insert lots of different things, there's options for that. If I want to produce a table here, uh, that can be done as well. So if this is new enough, I haven't actually used it very much and it's something I need to increase my expertise at. And maybe for you, since you're probably learning R Markdown from the very beginning, Maybe you just start with the visual editor and uh, find that increases your productivity. I'm still used to the, the source mode, so I'm gonna change back to that one. All right, another thing I'd like to show you how to do is uh, sometimes we don't actually want to show the code. So for example, uh, let's see if I closed out. Yeah, I have closed it out, let me do it again. Suppose in the document, I'm about to give this to a supervisor they don't understand our code. They really don't need to see all this stuff here. Really, they just need to know the result of the calculation, which is that we need 40 $20 bills. Well, I have some chunk options. Some of these are outlined in your notes, and these are also in the cheat sheets. Up here, where the, the chunk is initialized, I'm gonna add an option called echo. I'm gonna set it equal to false. Echo is whether the code is displayed or not. By default, it's true, and it does show the code. If I change it to false, it doesn't show the code. It still runs the code and evaluates it. 
and all the objects that are defined are still available for other R chunks. We just don't see the code itself. So let me knit with echo equal to false there. All right, and look, uh, the place where the code was, that's gone. So maybe we want to hide the, you know, the guts of the calculation from somebody who, who doesn't need to see it or be intimidated by it. Um, another common use of that, let me put in a little plot. So I'm going to come down here to the end. I'll use my hotkey, Control-Alt-I, to make a little R chunk. And there's a built-in uh, data set in R called Air Passengers. So maybe I'd like to see a plot of that. If I click knit. Okay, so I look at my output document and I can see both the code that produced the plot and then the actual plot of that data set itself. Most of the time when I'm making a plot, I don't actually want people to see the code that produced it. So let me change that again. I'll change echo equal to false. And it'll still show the result of the code, but not the code itself. So there's the plot uh, without that actual plot command being visible. All right, something kind of similar. So that first chunk that did all the paint calculations and we hid the code, you see how it's still putting out this 40? That 40 is a result of uh, this line right here that's spitting out the number of bills. I could remove that line if I don't want that to be visible, but here's another thing I could do. There's another chunk option called uh, results. I'm gonna set this to hide and that has to be inside quotation marks. Results equal hide means anything that would normally go to the console, it's just not gonna show it. So let me knit that. And, and now the document is much cleaner at the beginning. I'm not seeing the code or the console output. It's just available for R to use to put in that number 40. Okay. In the notes, there's a couple of other options. Uh, those are used more rarely. Uh, most of the time, just echo and results are the main two for deciding what you want to hide. All right, and I think that's the end of uh, lecture two. I'll talk about the homework in just a moment. But first, do you have any questions on the content covered? All right, so let's conclude by taking a look at your homework assignment. Uh, I'm thinking this will be a hopefully a fairly easy one for you. Uh, we'll see. I want you to create an R Markdown document and please make this a PDF document. That'll upload to Folio the best. Edit the YAM also has the title Homework 2 and then of course put your name in the author field. And I would like this document to contain these things. Make a section with a header visualization of trees data. Under the section header, make a chunk that contains the command plot trees. Trees is a built-in data frame or data set that's in R, so you don't have to create that. Just run that command. And I'd like you to set the chunk options so the code is not displayed, but the plot is. Just show the plot, not the command that produced it. Then make a section with header area of a circle. And under the section header, I'd like you to make a chunk that contains the command uh, area is equal to or assigned pi times uh, R squared, pi R squared. I'd like you to set the chunk option so this code is displayed, but it's not actually evaluated. Because you want to actually be defining a value for R, it won't be able to run this calculation, but I'd like you to just have it visible there so that somebody else could, you know, set them up, set up those calculations for themselves. Now, because this is a 5,000 level course, uh, there are some parts of the assignments that only the grad students will need to do, and those will typically tend to be a little bit more complicated. I want you to insert the LaTeX code that will produce this, A equal to pi R squared. Display the formula for area of a circle. Uh, so I know a lot of you are LaTeX users already, and that should be pretty quick and easy for you. If you're not, 
I'll just say Google it. Uh, LaTeX can have a steep learning curve, but for a simple formula like this, it won't be too bad. All right, going back to C, this is something that everybody has to do. Make a section with the header, the great gray beast February. Make a chunk that calculates the number of seconds in the month of February, assuming it's not a leap year, and then assigns the value to a variable seconds. Set your chunk option so the code is not visible, it's not displayed, but it is evaluated. And then write a line of text that states how many seconds are in February, making use of the seconds variable. That's gonna be something very similar to what's happening right here in this example. Something will be calculated that will automatically be inserted into the text and displayed for the reader. All right, and then the last thing, make a section with the header tasty dishes. Look at the R Markdown cheat sheet. I didn't show you how to make an ordered list to see if you can learn how to do that yourself and create an ordered list that has at least three of your favorite foods on it. No wrong answers there. When your document is ready, uh, knit it. Uh, please, please do it as a PDF, I prefer that. Upload your R Markdown document and your compiled PDF to the Dropbox and Folio. And uh, let me stop recording before I give semester specific details.